Let's touch one. Okay, hold on, guys. We're bringing him on. All right, one second. Glory to the Fox of Spirit. Have mercy on us, Lord. Ooh, I'm still recovering. I'm still recovering. Ugh. Bringing him on. Hold on, guys. One second. Tickeries. Tickeries. Oh, shit. Glory to the Fox of Spirit. That's what happens when you shave. Okay, we should be ready now. We should be ready now. Flash, yeah. huh? What happened? The flash, your shirt. Uh, flash. Uh, what, you got a problem with my shirt? Now you, you got a problem with my shirt? Are you going to send me, are you not going to send me like 50,000 videos on flash? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Okay, what's going on? What's happened? Where's everybody? I'm recovering from my cheat day, so I'm bloated and I'm angry. So Majid, how you doing? Majd and Diaskoros, can you guys hear us? Yes, hear you loud and clear. All right, good guys. Anyway, since we've done these shows, it's been World War Six. The drama that's starting online, it's like become on a whole other level. I don't know what's going on. Hey, it's okay, buddy. Forget your hair. Your hair's not going to do anything for you. I don't know what you're doing. You're going bald and you're fighting it. How old are you? No, I'm trying to. I'm trying to rub it in, Sam. You're going bald. I have it to wait, buddy. I look at that bicep. Get big. Anyway, yeah. So the latest stunt that you sent me was some Assyrians, not all Assyrians, took a clip of me attacking uh, Chloe, who is dishonoring the Blessed Mother, mm. who is disrespecting the Blessed Mother to try to demonize me. Is that what they're doing now? All right. That's what they're doing? Correct. So it's not all Assyrians. It's some Assyrians. Some Assyrians are doing it, so don't condemn the entirety of the Assyrian population. I'm Assyrian. So now they're adopting Muslim tactics. Instead of watching to learn, they're trying to find stuff to then make clips to try to discredit me. Gee, I've never had that done to me before, but that's part of the game. And then you're saying some of them said I'm excommunicated? Yeah, according to the Synod of uh, Sabarisho, yes. uh, they think that it's automatic excommunication, but I think that that's not how the church works. Work. Yeah, and well, I know Shamash Isaiah is listening, <clears throat> and I know he's behind. You haven't told me this, by the way. He hasn't told me this. I know, Shamash Isaiah, you're listening. I know you're behind the drama because you got your feelings hurt. You're very sensitive. You don't need to excommunicate me. I'm not going back to the Assyrian church. I just want everyone to know this. So now make a clip of this. Take a clip of this. Here. Assyrians, take a clip of this. I am not going back to the Assyrian church of the East. I'm done. It's over with. I'm finished. Not because I'm condemning the Assyrian church of the East. I just want to be clear. I'm not condemning the Assyrian church of the East. <clears throat> I thought I was clear. I condemn Theodore, and if that's blasphemy for you, then you're entitled. It's your church, so I'm not condemning church, but I'm done. As far as now the Assyrian church, I'm not going back there. I'm not taking Eucharist there, so that is now X. So don't wait for you guys to excommunicate me. I'm excommunicating myself. So now, with that said, you need to continue where you left off, but now remember, brethren, Keep it as simple as you can so people can understand what you're saying. And secondly, you got to bring your A game because in the comments section, people are coming after you saying, oh, this quotation doesn't exist or this is misinterpreted or you're quote mining. You're taking out of context. So you understand all eyes are on you. I don't know much about Oriental Orthodox. I don't know much about the priest schism fathers. I don't know much about what the Christians in the East prior to the Council of Ephesus taught about one nature after the Union. I am learning, and I have told people the Eastern Orthodox will come on, give their perspective, and even if a Roman Catholic wants to, they can come. Now, if you guys are wondering my voice, I'm old. It takes a while for my voice to warm up. So 
they're now listening to everything you're saying and trying to find errors in order to discredit you. So you owe it to your faith, to your church, to the saints of your church, to bring your A game, make sure you have studied the issue, you've read the context, you're not taking out of context, and you're defining the terms as they defined it at that time. Otherwise, you're going to do a disservice to your church. Don't do that. Bring your A game. So with that said, I'm here to facilitate. Continue where you left off. Thank you, Sam. Uh, and if it's okay, I want to I want to say something real quick before sure. we start. Yes. Um, so I want to address two things, two things actually before we start. Before we start. First, I want to address um, some 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 deal on Twitter had uh, direct messaged me saying things like uh, uh, some accusations about me doxing, and um, I did not dox anyone. I don't dox people. Um, if I have a problem with you, I tell you directly that I have a problem with you. I don't go and dox. Saying your ethnic group, saying your ethnic group, David Erhan, that's not doxing. Doxing is not saying an ethnic group. Doxing is if I wanted to say your name, your real name, that you don't want people to know, that would be doxing. I don't care about you enough to think about you in my free time so that I can dox you. Yeah. You're not on my mind. To dox. Always on my mind. Unlike you, who do, who do, does dox people, like what you did with Jonathan Hill, you put his social security number up and stuff. Okay, and second, uh, so he did dox somebody. Yeah, he's doxed multiple people. Um, mm. Now, uh, Kai, Kai, I know you called me. We talked for two hours. Uh, you told uh, me you I'm not you know, right. on anymore. Whatever. Okay. Uh, and you said we're amicable, and you told people we're amicable, and you keep using amicable. And I love Ty, by the way. I do love him. I know, I know Sam. This isn't. Uh, before you say that, I just want people to tell you, I'll let you know. Ty is a treasure for the Eastern Orthodox Church. He's brilliant, and so is Perry Robinson. So do not, I, I know there's some beef between the two of you, and I pray God will heal that schism between the two of you. What I'm just letting everyone else, he is not what you would call an ortho bro. He's on another level, him and Perry Robinson. But sadly, there are some differences now between him and Kai. So go ahead, share your point. I, I still, I don't have anything personal with Kai. Kai, uh, you, we are amicable as far as I go. I don't have a problem you calling us monophysites. Whatever, that's okay. That's you're being uh, classical to your tradition. That's fine with me. Uh, but for you to call us low IQ is not nice because that's not how our relationship has been. If you're upset about the reply from Philip Zeno, you know, like you, huh? <laughs> yeah, if, if you're upset about the reply from Philip Zeno saying that you smell like a whopper or something, whatever he said. Wait, 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 hold on. Someone yeah. said guy smells like a whopper. I'll, I'll read, I'll read the, the thing. Oh, by he the said, way, yeah, I'm not trying to joke. I'm the one, and I'm not being humble. I'm the one low IQ. This stuff is new to me. And sadly, I smell like a whopper because I'm a single dude and I reek of the pit of hell. But go ahead. So uh, the, the tweet goes, Brahmin Hindu Kai confesses universal incarnation to own the Monophysites and Nestorians. And then there's Hindi writing. And then it says, you can't look like this and talk SHIT. I will not allow it. Bro looks like he smells like a whopper. Damn. So, so th this is what this is oh, after you called us low IQ. There was no attacks on Kai in this whole diorite controversy. They put out a series about us, Sam. For years, we didn't say a word. A whole series they put out about us. We didn't say a word. Now we're finally talking on your channel. They're all mad, telling us we're low IQ. With their personal shots. I don't know. They're, they're, they're dying from fear. For um, what? I don't know. What? I don't know. Yeah. Well, since when is Kai calling us low IQ? Our relationship hasn't been like that. It's you know? because of the truth. I, I think because they know some, but not all, of the citations we're going to be bringing up. And you will notice that with the Chalcedonians, the Imperial Chalcedonians, that with a lot of these quotations um, that are contextualized, by the way, and we'll, we will explain why the context yeah, please. It does not allow for any kind of Chalcedonian diophysitism, whether it's any of the four to six 
uh, Christologies that they've dogmatized through the centuries yeah. and that it only allows for our Christology. And so the, these aren't quote mines as we get accused of if quote mining yeah. means decontextualizing stuff, which yeah. we believe they do and they might believe we do it, but you will see through our presentation that we explain in depth what each of these quotes are doing. You've seen that with three already. You're going to see it with a lot more today yes. after Maj's presentation detailing the Christological vocabulary. And keep in mind, this whole time to the listener, keep in mind that what we are presenting, all of it is from the three saints who were presiding bishops, not just bishops, but presiding bishops at the Council of Ephesus and mm -hmm. Many of their excerpts are from the very acts of the Council of Ephesus itself or else from the surrounding, you know, events. Yeah. And we're, so we're we have here. to, I believe, have compassion on the people who are calling us stuff like low IQ or quote mining because exactly. they really have no response. They have never had a response to our contextualized <laughs> citations before, nor will they in the future because there is no such possible one. Just like how there is no such possible... Um, I guess you could say rebut that a Mohammedan could make against certain excerpts of the yeah. Quran. They, they try. They, they yeah. this, this, is this is a good segue, Dioscoros, into your presentation. But before we start, last thing I want to say, yes. uh, Erhan, I don't know your location. I never shared your location. I don't care where your location is. If you live in Antarctica, you live on Mars. I don't know. I, don't, I never thought about it. It doesn't occur to me or to yeah. share it. Uh, yeah, but you, you have a doctor. Brother. You're living you in a particular area. I had an assumption of, I was like, I'm going to somewhere. Let me reach out to Maverick before when he was still in your guys' circle, Maverick the Confessor. When uh, when he was still in your guys' circle, I said, let me reach out to him because I think uh, David Erhan might be in this so-called area. Uh, I don't want to say particular. Um, it was It's a country. It's not. It's not a... It's not a, it's like not a, a direct location. It's a general country. And I said, I'm, I'll be there um, if he's if he's in this country. Uh, I would love to meet him face to face, David Erhan. David Erhan. Both times Both you said times. no. And why am I going to Maverick, David Erhan? Is because David Erhan blocked me. Why did David Erhan block me? I have no yeah. idea. Okay. So. Now, just the uh, only thing I my concern is. We don't. We're not going to talk about personnel. We're going to keep it on issues. But if he has docs, people, and this is documented, documented. because there was there was someone who wrote a blog post who is uh, critical of the orthobros. But the right here. David Erhan docs me and put my social security number in the video. Okay. So so the point being, if he did that. He needs to be called to, to account. He needs to be held accountable. He needs to be called out because the beams in his eyes sticking out. So if he has done that, he needs to be called out for that. But keep it professional, brethren. Yeah. I know there are nasty people in every camp. I've met them. There are nasty jerks, the Assyrian right. Church of the East, nasty jerks who are Roman Catholics, nasty jerks or eastern orthodox because i've seen them and some people think i'm a nasty jerk that's okay you can think i'm a nasty jerk there are times in which i look at my face and i think i'm a nasty jerk but my point is you have scum in all the major branches of the body of christ that give a bad name for the rest we want to go higher than that and not alienate and demonize the entire group Sam, right. exactly. Yeah. Like it, when I'm when he's saying, like Kai's saying, you're low IQ. I didn't say back your low IQ. Erhan, when when uh, he's he's saying this stuff about me, I'm not telling him anything. I didn't say anything to Erhan about the the doxing. Yeah, or right. yeah you, we not, know you haven't said people. Yeah. You don't need to defend yourself because, as far as the material is concerned, you've never mentioned names, meaning right. these guys, so the people can go see the first self parts. What I'm just saying is. Sadly, and I'm just trying to make this comment, there are jerks in every major branch of the body of Christ. I've met them. And people think I'm a jerk. I don't, you know, it's okay. I mean, I do. I know I got anger issues and I rub people the wrong way. And now you can see there are nasty low lives among the Assyrian Church of the East. Amir Khmiqa, Labricha, that clown, that dog. And then Father Daniel, who turns out to be Marmari's secretary, another clown. Two-faced, right? 
attacking me, calling me a wolf, and then you see now taking snippets from my sessions to try to demonize me. See, they're low lives. They give their church a bad name. But we are going to go above that. Okay, we're going to go above that. Ignore these low life trash because that's what they are. They're trash. The Lord deal with them. Stick to the issues. Present the facts. Because the facts speak for themselves. When someone resorts to attacking your personality, means they can't refute you. So stick to the issues. Get into the meat of the matter. When you just quote and you just cite and they attack your personality, that only makes you shine even more. Mm -hmm. All right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm, I'm trying to tell these people. It's not like David Erhan and I were best friends that he told me secrets. I don't have any secrets from David Erhan. Whatever I know, David Erhan was public information. Ethnic so, groups are, are not a secret. So, yeah, that's all right. He can say what he wants. If he's docs people and people are now documented, may the Lord Jesus continue to expose him because then that means, sorry, guy, I love you. You know, I have respect for you, Pierre Robinson. He's a rat. And may God expose him as a rat. He's a rat. Now come after me and attack me. But anyway, let's begin. Let's focus. Let's get to the issues because people want to hear about the issues because a lot of people don't know about Oriental Orthodox. They don't know about the priest schism, fathers and writers. This is new to me and to many folks because miaphysitism is something out in the fringes to those in the West. Those in the West, they'll hear about miaphysitism, all oh, fringe group. They don't know the history and the evidence and why Oriental Orthodox are miaphysites. So let's get into the evidence. Let's share. Let's do it. Um, now, we were, I believe, planning to have Magid present his presentation first because he made a very lovely presentation where he goes over all of the terminologies and definitions and stuff, which oh. mine doesn't do. So, How dare you um, call him a Magid? I just said uh, Simon said just called him a Magid. That, that's because of the Egyptian accent. I know, I know. When, when they say Njil, they say Ngil. I know, I know. Yeah. Jamal, but to us, it sounds like he called you a Magid. If this is your friend, what are your enemies going to do? Well, go ahead. Exactly. Okay, so I will start off by sharing my screen. And again, I want to thank you, Sam, for having us here. My uh, pleasure. One second. Okay. So we've been have we've been using uh, very difficult terms the previous sessions we've had, yes. and I think we are obliged to to explain them and explain why we believe that miaphysitism is correct. Can you see my screen? Yes, it's on screen now. The Oriental Orthodox Church agrees. The yeah. Church is on. Okay. So, uh, first of all, we have to uh, go through these terms. So, first of all, is person. In Greek, it is called prosopon. And in Aramaic, or Assyrian, or Syriac, or whatever you want to call it, it's parsopa or farsofa. And so, prosopon, I will be using more the Greek terms, uh, means the identity of an existing being or individual so for instance sam daniel dioscorus Mejd, these are prosopa persons and then we have another uh, interesting term uh, which is hypostasis hypostasis in aramaic it's gnoma and hypostasis uh, gets confused with the term person because of chalcedonians and i will explain later uh, why and why that's problematic and what it means is individual existence or subsistence. So by that, we mean that, for instance, a body is an individual entity. So therefore, it is a hypostasis. A soul is an individual entity. Therefore, it is a hypostasis. And then you have substance or essence in English. And both are both have the same definition or uh, word in, in Greek and Aramaic, and it's usia. And usia basically means a compendium of many hypostases. So it is the whatness. So for instance, we have body, which is the hypostasis, and then you have bodiness, all, all, or all bodies. That's the usia. And then nature, in Greek is physis, and in Aramaic is kiana. And it can refer to, uh, or actually I will explain what it can refer to, but it simply means being or to exist. So why is this important? Because when we have a correct understanding of these terms, that's the only time when we can actually arrive to the correct conclusion of who Christ is. And not only about Christ, but the Trinity and everything else. So, first of all, what did the Chalcedonian Church do? 
they changed the definition of the terms prosopon and they make they made it identical to the word hypostasis and they they made the word thesis identical to the word usia and that's problematic because which uh, we will see later on with saint cyril if prosopon is hypostasis then christ has to be from two persons and i will explain later on why now before uh, you and you go yeah. on brother just no, no, go ahead. Slide down a little bit so people can keep up with you. Sure. So and if you I'm, have any questions, you can also yeah, ask them. That's why I'm inter interjecting here because now, so people understood what you said. Prosopan in Aramaic, parsopa, would be what we would refer to as a person. Mm -hmm. But the Greek word hypostasis or hypostasis is in Aramaic the word knuma. Kanuma and a kanuma, because when you say individual, see, here's where you're going to confuse people. Individual existence. When a person thinks individual, he's going to think person. Mm -hmm. See, this is, I, I know that. I know that's what you're shaking. I know that's not what you mean. But when I think individual existence, that's an individual. An individual is a person. Mm -hmm. This is why you're using a term with one definition, but you're confusing your audience because when you say individual existence, oh, an individual. Oh, well, that's a person. And then when you say body and soul are knuma, that confuses the people more. So let me try to work with you so I can get it, so they can get it. Sure. When you say knuma hupostasis or hupostasis, however you want to pronounce the term, we would, so we don't confuse it with a person, that would refer to an instance, what I would say a particularization or an example of a specific nature, right? Yes. So you specific. are an example, an instance of human nature. But that term knuma, when you say you are a knuma of human nature, I just want people to understand so we can, because I want them to learn this. When you are a knuma of a human nature, that means you are an example, an instance of this human nature, and there are others as well, like Daniel is a knuma of human nature. I am a knuma of human nature. You are a knuma of your nature. It simply means that this nature can be found in multiple instantiations, meaning you're one instantiation or an example of it. I'm another, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're a person. Exactly, because for instance, a stone, can, uh, exactly. An individual stone doesn't have its own personhood. It doesn't have its exactly. own prosopon. It's still an exactly. individual individual stone. It exists, and it is one. Correct. Let me let me use the example I did yesterday on my show exactly because I use a stone. Let me help you guys because uh, you guys got if you don't get this the whole debate is on these terms. <laughs> so we may go a little slower here. They got they can use many parts, but once you learn the terms, then you're going to see what the debate is about. Oh. That's what the debate is about. Hold on, buddy. One second. Let me use the example I did yesterday. Okay, sir? Don't stone me, yes. Maggie. I'm sorry, Ratchet. <laughs> I, I won't. won't. I'm sorry. Ready? That's, it's going to be, he's gonna, never going to forget this now. That's it, it buddy. That's the that's name. It's going to stick. Yeah, okay. I'm used to it. Trust me. <laughs> Guys, I'm still bloated, but I still look skinny. I'm gorgeous. Ow! Anyway, here. Let me show you why Knuma doesn't mean person. I used the example yesterday. I'm going to be repeating it later on. When I finish my discussion of Marmides, okay. This is a knuma. This is a knuma. This is a knuma of iPhone. This is a knuma of iPhone. See, this is what a knuma is, but it's not a person. This is a knuma, it's not a person. So when they're using the term knuma, they're not saying persons, they're saying a particular example. <clears throat> A particularization, an instance of a particular essence. So this is a knuma of iPhone. This is another knuma of iPhone, but they're not persons. A person is a parsopa. So he's using the term parsopa or prosopan for person. Did everyone get that? You got this, we can move on. Yes. That knuma or hypostasis <clears throat> as defined by the Oriental Orthodox as defined by the Syrian Orthodox. They're using the word hypostasis, Greek, Aramaic, not to mean person. 
but a particular instance of a specific nature. See, this is a knuma. This is a particular instance. Instantiation is a technical term of iPhone, but it's not a person. Here's another instantiation or particular <clears throat> instance of iPhone. These are two knume, but they're not persons. They don't have prasopan. Everyone got it? Let me just and there is a reason for that, which I will be going through later on. Yes. Uh, Oriental Orthodoxy and the Assyrian Church of the East Assyrian. both agree on these definitions. So yes. now what he's telling you is, in Chalcedon, they made the word knuma the same as person. This is where the debate began. So now here's where the debate begins. The Oriental Orthodox, the Syriac Christians, when they say knuma, they don't mean person. But because the Greek word is hypostasis. So Aramaic Syriac, it's knuma. In Greek, it's hypostasis. When in Chalcedon, they started defining hypostasis to mean person, that's where the debate took place. Wait, wait. To us, a hypostasis is a person. So if you're saying there are two hypostases in Jesus, you're saying two persons. They're saying that's not how we define the term. We're not saying hypostases means person. He has two hypostases, but he's not two persons because we don't define it the way you do. And that's where the problems began. Now continue, brother. Yep. So I just want to say, uh, Majd and Dios Koros, uh, before we continue, Mm -hmm. um, so that and correct me if I'm wrong, you guys. The tome, Le, the tome of Leo, was in Latin. Yes. So when it was translated into Greek for Chalcedon. It was translated by Theodoret into Greek. Yes, at and, first. And when he translated it, and correct me because I don't know Latin, so correct my terms if the Latin is wrong. Persona, Persona. Latin, he translated it to hypostasis in Greek. And natura in the Latin, he translated it to fusis in the Greek. Is that right? I'm not sure about his trans translation. Uh, I'm pretty well, the, the thing, yeah, the thing is, is that Leo wrote like uh, what's called the second tome later in his in throughout his career um mm -hmm. because there was so much opposition to the tome and he was basically like, oh my gosh, why is everyone opposing my tome? It's so good, uh, <laughs> but. Um, realistically it's not we say, that we say sam's we say sam's cough is a witness go ahead yeah yeah because yeah, yeah several times right well so the thing is is that leo's tome it might have not really been uh translated that far from how it used how its own definition but in the definition of chalcedon itself it did speak of one hypothesis now one testimony towards, towards what the tome was translated as um there there's a refutation of chalcedon written by saint timothy the second of alexandria uh, who lived in like uh, who was patriarch of alexandria in like the, the 450s so like right after chalcedon pretty much like within a decade um and he quotes probably like 60 percent of the tome throughout that document maybe more um and he like refutes it part by part and then he has a big florilegium of quotes, including some of the ones in my presentation. And, um, and uh, that one, he says, he translates, or not, I shouldn't say translates, because he was originally writing, writing in Greek. And he put both uh, one person and one hypothesis, which is actually more charitable towards Leo's tome than it is in the original Latin. So it may be that statements like that were translated one person and one hypothesis. Um, it's unclear, though. To me, at least I don't recall. Okay. okay. All right. So now that they understood, you're going to have to watch it several times, folks. If most of you got it, great. That you're using pneuma, Syriac word, which in Greek is hypostasis to mean an instance, an example of a nature. You don't mean it as person. But then on the other side, they're saying, no, hypostasis means person. That's where the debates happen. So go ahead. Continue so yes. they can follow. So, so if prosopon is hypostasis or hypostasis, then how is Nestorius wrong? Because as we saw, I think, uh, like the, fir uh, the first ses uh, session, we showed Nestorius saying that the prosopon is one, 
for instance here are some like quotes I, I won't read them because yeah but because we read them i think like, last well, time. let me let me read at least the bold ones let me read. yeah okay this is nestorius guys this is nestorius who is condemned because supposedly he taught nestorianism but now watch they're gonna read him Go guys and notice please all the sources we read from are written explicitly and if any if any of the sources are not written or if any of the sources are wrong we are more than happy to face that and correct whatever mistakes there are yes right can a man when he hears these things say i'm reading the bold Say that something else was said by him and by those at Chalcedon and by Leo, for openly he is bold and knows the same Christ who is visible in the invisible and the visible nature, nor has said two Christ and two sons and lords. You want me to keep going to the other bold ones? Yeah. So well, just so we can understand, so in the story saying, I don't believe there are two Christ, two sons, two lords. It's the same Christ. Who is both visible and invisible? It's the same Christ. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that that that's what Casadon taught, and that he agrees with it. So you hearing, guys? Okay, guys, did you hear this? Nestorius is saying, "I agree with Chalcedon. I am saying what they're saying. It is not two Christ, two sons, two lords. It's one Christ who is both visible, invisible, who has two natures. It's one Christ. So he's saying, I agree." with leo and those at the council so go ahead so guys i want you guys to think about this especially those of you who are um, historically critically thinking like i am you you care about the history of this so why is it that chalcedon accepted theodoret's so-called repentance i don't know since when is it repent imagine you go to your father of confession you're doing confession with him and you tell him, father i was always right and he called counts that as repentance. This is what Theodoret did at Chalcedon. They count it as repentance, whatever. That's their problem. But that they accept it. Nestorius saying, I agree with Leo and, and, and Chalcedon, but you guys don't want to count Nestorius to repent. Why? Because it makes you look bad. That's why. You don't want to uh, exonerate Nestorius at the council that is being accused of being Nestorian. Uh, you didn't read Cyril's third letter to Nestorius at, on purpose. Cyril's letter that he has the 12 anathemas that are divinely inspired, like the, the Nicene Creed. Someone just sent that to me, believe it? Huh? Oh, and don't worry, we're oh, going to yeah. present it later. Yeah, yeah, because someone was trying to send it to me in uh, Facebook Messenger. It goes, read the 12 anathemas. I said, dude, I don't have time to read it. It's going to be on the show. But someone just sent that to me. But go ahead. Talk about dude, the 12 anathemas. These, are, these are, are, are divinely inspired, non-negotiable. Yes. So, uh, for Ephesus 449 that you guys don't accept that has the uh that that has no definition of dogma at it all Ephesus 449 did is it brought the Nicene Creed and it brought the 12 anathemas of Cyril and said this is our faith we don't have anything else but this okay let me let me explain what you said remember guys you know this like the back of your hand there were two councils at Ephesus brethren listen I want you to learn I'm having them on so you can learn, so I can learn to go to higher level. They had two councils in Ephesus, 431 and then 449. He's saying that in the year 449 at the second council of Ephesus, what they did was they took the 12 anathema. Now, for those of you who don't know what an anathema is, it means you're condemned. It's used by Paul in Galatians 1, 8 to 9. If we are an angel from heaven to preach a gospel, other than the one we preach, let him be anathema. You're being a curse condemned. Now, the 12 anathemas were written by who? St. Cyril. Cyril of Alexandria. So St. Cyril of Alexandria, saint for the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholics, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. He wrote 12 anathemas saying, whoever doesn't believe this or believes this, anathema, 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 12 of them. So at this council, you're saying they were not talking about dogma. They were just bringing the anathemas with what? The Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed. So they're saying, you got it from the Nicene Creed, and here are 12 anathemas. If you say this, or you say this, or you don't say this, anathema. Okay. Just we got it now. Go ahead. Yeah. So the, the 12 anathemas, but yeah, for if the if anybody has the discord things on, please mute yeah, it. Someone uh, says, yeah, mute yeah. your discord. I'm not on discord. It's against my so, religion. So, uh, you guys, yeah, we the, can hear it actually. <laughs> the, the, the 12 anathemas, 
what does it tell the suspicious side, which is our side? What does it tell us that we are suspect of you? That when you are, when Nestorius is agreeing with your counsel, Theodore is getting exonerated for saying Theodore was always like, uh, orthodox. Ibas's letter is accepted, which says Cyril repented of his Apollinarianism in the 12 anathemas, and that the 12 anathemas are Apollinarian, and Theodore of Mopsuestia is blessed. What does it say? And then on top of all that, the third letter of Cyril to Nestorius, a.k.a. the 12 anathemas, are not read at Chalcedon. So then, it, uh, what does it say? It quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, whatever. It's a duck. Yeah, yeah. Shoot, okay. it's a duck, yeah, when duck season. Yeah. So no. what What counsel the 12 anathemas were not read? Chalcedon. Said again? Chalcedon did not read the 12 anathemas on purpose. What was the purpose of them not reading it again? It's up to you. Well, what because... Yeah. We'll see that the content of it is extremely anti diophysite and they were trying to pedal towards diophysite. Right. Okay. So people understand now because this is a question I had because they keep asking me this. Okay. St. Cyril, they've established from the quotes I've seen. Now, listen, brethren, this is gold what they're giving you. And then when Kai comes, you're going to hear two perspectives and you'll be the judge. But he's they're preparing you for what they believe. So for Eastern Orthodox, Catholic, you may have not heard this. I haven't heard it. Never heard it. So I'm learning. That's why I want to hear all sides. Now, they've shown you quotes, and they'll come up again. St. Cyril of Alexandria was a Miaphysite. After the union, he's he's you, they read him, one person, one nature. So you can't say by one nature he means one person, right? Because he says one person, one nature, correct? He yeah, said that, that right? One person is established by one nature after the union. Okay. So, so after the union, he's one person, one nature. Now, here's the dilemma. St. Cyril is a Miaphysite, but the Council of Chalcedon affirmed diaphysitism. So I got to say these words slowly. Now, you may be wondering, what are these terms? That's why you got to watch the previous parts. Miaphysitism says that after the union, after Christ the Word became flesh, the divine and human make up one composite nature. They didn't mix in. They didn't fuse. He's truly divine, truly human, but they make up now one composite nature. The coal that's lit, you can't separate now the fire from the coal. Yes. That's it. So now, but as you're going to go through it, I just want to make this because this was something that they keep asking me, and I, mm -hmm. I don't know the answer. Now, at the Council of Chalcedon, they're saying, no, after the union, it's still two natures. That's what diaphysitism means. Mia means one. It's a feminine form of the word hen. Dia means two, right? Diaphysitism or diophysitism means two. But St. Cyril affirmed one composite nature. So he's saying... That's the reason why, most likely, trying to be charitable here, they didn't read Cyril's 12 anathemas because St. Cyril anathematizes anyone who doesn't speak of one nature after the union. But then at the council, especially with the Tome of uh, Leo, they're saying it's two natures, so they're affirming the aphysitism. How does that work if St. Cyril, whom they recognize as a saint, is contradicting the view of diaphysitism. So that's the point, right? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Well, you know, you know, because that's what they tell me. I, I just want to give two examples. We're going to go over the 12 anathemas in depth, but I want to give two examples just real quick, just so people have an idea. The fourth anathema says, you cannot take verses from the Bible and say this is the human nature doing this, and verses from the Bible, and say this is the divine nature Man, doing it. You would have condemned me to hell. The, the 12th anathema says, it is the word of God incarnate who was crucified for us. These are so two the 12th examples. anathema says, the word of God was incarnate, was crucified for us. Yes. What yeah. does that and mean? I will cover that in this presentation. Okay, but, now continue with the, the quotations. I just want to yeah. clarify because this is why I said it's going to take you more than three four sessions because you're doing it for the audience. You guys know this stuff. If you want yeah. us to learn what the issues are, we got to understand. So go ahead. 
and that's why I like I think we're doing this like this specific session because I think we're obliged to explain these yeah. terms and these yes. definitions and why yeah we have them. Uh, okay. Do you want to yeah. continue reading yeah. something or sure? Um, okay. For this reason, I'm again. I'm just going to read the bold. Okay. Yes. For this reason, the union is in the prosopon and not in the nature, which the Catalonians also say. But there is only one prosopon in the union, for the prosopon is common, one and the same. Nestorius. So, for people to understand what Nestorius said, this is Nestorius. He's saying there's one person. Do you understand? Prosopon means person. So, what did Nestorius say? There is only one person, right? This reason the union is in the person, not in the nature, meaning it's the person that unites the natures. And he's only one person. That's what Prosopon wants. So that's what the story is taught. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Yes. So first of all, is Prosopon identical with hypostasis? Well, when you look at the pre schism fathers, because these are the only ones I would like to cite in the, uh, when explaining these definitions, at least with hypostasis and prosopon, we see that they make a distinction. So first of all, we have St. Cyril of Alexandria. He says, I will also just read the bold one, uh, through which the person, prosopon, of each is made to lie in a peculiar hypostasis. So see, he's saying that each person, he's talking about the Trinity here, lies in a peculiar hypostasis meaning an individual hypostasis. So say they all truly exist, but it's bound into unity of Godhead through natural identity. So you see that if you if you go by the Chalcedonian definition or Chalcedonian understanding of what prosopon and hypostasis are, he will be saying person of each is made to lie in a peculiar person. And that's like, it doesn't even make sense. So let's you read have... it again just for, for it to sink in. Through yeah. which the person of each, person here being prosopon, through which the prosopon of each is made, what is that word? Uh, in Greek. Yeah. Is ferete. Okay. It's to lie word. in a peculiar hypostasis. So clearly St. Cyril here is distinguishing between a prosopon and between hypostasis. Mm. They are not exactly. the same. So, so guys, do you see that? St. Cyril of Alexandria doesn't define prosopon to mean hypostasis. Did you guys catch it? St. Cyril of Alexandria is defining prosopon differently from the word hypostasis. So prosopon does not mean hypostasis in St. Cyril's theology. Not only him, most, most fathers, especially like the Greek fathers, because they were like the, let's say, philosophers of, of the church, they all made a distinction between prosopon and hypostasis. I would like to go through St. Basil right now. That's yes, good. So I, but, but remember, the biggest name you have here so far, because he's a saint for the Catholic Eastern, is St. Cyril of Alexandria. So I want to hand you Basil. Saint, Basil. Oh, Saint, Basil. Saint, Saint Basil is too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. St. Basil, St. Gregory, Saint Gregory all of them, most of them. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, the Capitolian Fathers. Okay, go yeah. ahead. So, so he says, yeah. Go the ahead. persons as being without hypostasis, but... In persons here again being pros prosopa, the prosopa yeah. as being without hypostasis. But if they concede that the prosopa exists in real hypostasis, as they acknowledge, so then again, the purpose of the quote is to show the viewer the distinction between the words, they are not yes. using them as synonyms or interchangeably, exactly. And there is a reason for that because the Sabellians. Modalist used to confess three prosopa, three persons, but one hypostasis for the Trinity, and because of that, they were they like they would uh, they were accused of saying that God sometimes showed Himself as Father and sometimes as Son and sometimes yeah, as Holy Spirit because none of them had a real let's say independent existence. None of them were truly individuals. Okay. And that's why the Father is writing against. St. Basil the Great, just he's, he's attacking heretics, and he's defining the term prosopon differently from hypostasis. Are you catching it? Now, for those of you who don't know church history, not only St. Cyril of Alexandria, St. Basil the Great and the two Gregories are considered some of the greatest Trinitarian apologists and defenders of the Trinity that ever existed. They're called the Cappadocian Fathers. Yes. So St. Basil the Great is a saint for the Eastern Orthodox the Catholic, as well as the Orthodox, right? 
You guys, yes. of course, he's the same. He's yes. a huge name, guys. And look what they're showing you, that he does not define the word hypostasis as prosopon. Prosopon means person. Hypostasis doesn't mean that. He's defining them differently. So if someone comes and says, well, when they said, you know, one <clears throat> hypostasis and they meant, no, here you're seeing to them prosopon means person. But hypostasis doesn't mean person. So there you go. Okay, come on. And then the last quote, which again uh, from St. Basil. Just to we must that. confess each prosopon to have a substantial existence in real hypostasis. That's there you go again. Now, each prosopon, he's referring to the Trinity, correct? Uh, yes, yes. Each prosopon. Okay, so notice for Basil... The father is a prosopan. The son is a prosopan. The Holy Spirit is a prosopan. What we would say, persons, mm -hmm. but they have one hypostasis. Uh, no, that, say, that, each, that each person, the father, the son, the Holy Spirit, hypostasis. have their own hypostasis. Yeah. And they have one, one, one uh, uh, essence. Yes, one essence. Yes, yeah, no, but if they each have their own hypostasis, then that means there are three separate hypostasis. But the quote no. you're reading, yeah, so that's why I said what I said because you're going to confuse us here. We must confess each person to have a substantial existence in real hypostasis. He didn't say their own hypostasis because the hypostasis would be common to all three, right? The usia would be common to all three. So what he's so saying what is... What does it mean? Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. That's what I say. I got confused the hell out of myself. Okay. Calm down, buddy. So you can smack me later. <laughs> okay. Now I... See? Sorry. Because I got carried away. I'm, I'm defining hypostasis as essence. See? That's why. Okay. Let me correct my stupidity. Now, oh. see? That's why. Because when you see three persons, I'm thinking three persons, one nature. No, no. All right. now. So now let's... Let me correct myself on the spot. This was beautiful. You're here to correct me so I can get. See, I'm learning too. Each of them is a prosopon, and each of them have their own real hypostasis because hypostasis here does not mean nature. See, that's where I forgot because I'm and stupid. Doesn't mean person. Yeah. Doesn't mean nature. Yes, and doesn't... yes they're that all means distinct they, from each other. They are a particular example. Of the divine nature. So the father is a person and an instantiation. So if I were to use the technical term, he's a prosopon and a hypostasis. Yes. Right? The son okay. is a, another prosopon and hypostasis. The Holy Spirit is another prosopon and hypostasis because hypostasis doesn't mean nature, it means that these are three examples instances of the divine nature and each of them are a prosopon so are you seeing prosopon is what refers to a person hypostasis refers to a particular example of a nature so go ahead now i got it all right sorry buddy no problem <clears throat> so what's the relation between prosopon and hypostasis then so this is a post schism father so like saint severus is a heretic for the Chalcedonians. But I'm using him to show what we believe in and why we use the language we use, which is based on Saint Cyril. We call him so, Tagi Tagurai, one of the Assyrians. We call. Him. So Saint Severus says, first he's first. explaining what self-subsisting hypostases are. So he says, when hypostases subsist by individual subsistence, as for instance those of Peter and Paul, whom the authority of the apostleship united, then there will be a union of persons. And brotherly association, not a natural uh, junction of one hypostasis made of, uh, made up out of two that is free from confusion. So what he's saying is that when hypostasis can subsist by their, by their own, they have their own personhood, their own identities, personalities. Okay. And so when when these hypostasis unite, which have their own prosopa persons, the union is not a natural one. It's not a, a, a union in nature or hypostasis, but a union between persons like pa St. Paul and, and Peter. And then yeah. he explains what non-subsisting hypostasis are. Oh boy. So he says, but when hypostasis do not subsist in individual subsistence, as also in the case of the man among us, 
I mean him who is composed of soul and body, but are without conf confusion recognized in union and composition, being distinguished by the intellect only and displaying one hypostasis made out of two. Such a union, none will be so uninstructed as to call one of persons. So he's saying, when we look at, for instance, a man, he is composed of two hypostases, which I will be showing from earlier fathers even. When he's composed of two hypostases, because these two hypostases do not exist on their own, uh, uh, like... They're unified uh, in the person? Sorry? Because they're unified in the person? They're unified. They they've always existed as one. When 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 someone is conceived, uh, like conception, they 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 exist always as one. And so the yes. person is attributed to that one hypostasis, which is made of two. Okay. Uh, let me see. So the two that make the person are the the uh, soul and the body. Yes, right. right. Together. Yeah. Okay. Now, yeah, just so you are made of two. Yeah, you read. You speak a little too fast, uh, Maggot. Uh, but let's That's slow it down. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'll we'll come back. Okay. So, so we can all fo follow you, buddy. I don't know. It's like you're rushing to go to dinner. You'll get to dinner, man. Don't. No, no. Just... It, it, it's late. That's why. <laughs> okay. So, so we can understand because this man is brilliant and he's speaking on a level that's going to take us 50 years to go to Oxford Philosophy School to figure out. So let me figure out what he's saying here. When hypostases do not subsist in individual subsistence, as also in the case of the man among us. I mean, him who is composed of soul and body, but are without confusion, recognized in union and composition. All right, I'm going to explain that in a minute. I just want to see what he meant by yes. two. Being distinguished by the intellect only and displaying one, hypostasis is made out of two. Okay. Such union will be so uninstructed as to call one of persons. All right, so the hypostasis of this man, meaning this man is an instantiation of human nature. But to be a hypostasis of human nature means you have to be composed of two parts, body and soul. Yes. So I, that's why so I'm trying to help people because people are like me. We're trying to figure it out. So understand what this quote from this brilliant theologian who would make William Lane Craig look like a kindergarten idiot. Anyway, so you understand what he's saying is if you are a hypostasis of human nature, a knuma of human nature, to be a hypostasis is human nature, there has to be two parts to you, body and soul. Body and soul, because you can't be human if you don't have a body and if you don't have a soul that's united. So he's saying that the hypostasis of the man is composed of the two, body and soul. So you guys with me? So hypostasis. Say it again. Which themselves are hypostasis. Like they, but that was the other element. So Sorry. to him, not only is the hypostasis and sanctification of a man <clears throat> realized in the union of the body-soul, but you can speak of the body as a hypostasis of human nature and the soul as a hypostasis of human nature. Yes, and that's okay, why so you... Guys, you, you see how technical this is? Now, these guys think we're going to figure it out uh, in the next 50 years. But you see how technical it got? Okay, so now what he's saying... He's saying is that you can even speak of the human body as a hypostasis and the human soul as another hypostasis, but they become one in the man. Is that and what that the quote each, is? Yeah, and that not like each hypostasis does not have its own person. So the unity is in between persons, exactly. but between yeah. hypostasis. Which is beautiful because that's one of the objections. Love. Okay. Now, the soul and the body have the same person. It's the same person that has the soul and the body. So the body is not a separate person and the soul is not a separate person. So they're not two persons. They're one person per, uh, per sopa. So two hypostases, a body and a soul, but they're united in the man and both of them have only one person per sopa. They don't and one hypostasis. Have... Say it again. And one hypostasis, even. So both of them yeah, compose the one the union, hypostasis. Yes. And so one that's person. after the union, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, even like they don't exist separately before because you know when we are conceived, it's like one. But sep we can conceive of them as being two in the mind, and they become two in reality when death happens. I will like uh, illustrate this with a diagram. When you die, 
Well, then what? Then there are two hypostases? Yes, they separate and become... The union is dissolved at death. Yes. Okay. So now let me ask a question as you continue. So at death, the union is dissolved. So that body, that's a human hypostasis, returns. Mm -hmm. But the human soul, it's still united to the parsopa because obviously we don't believe in secession of existence after death, right? Yeah. So, so the prosopon is located in the hypostasis. So when you die, your body is in the grave decomposing. Meanwhile, your, your soul goes up to paradise with your consciousness, with your personality and so on. Well, the parsopa goes to heaven as a human soul. Yes. Uh, but the human body is being dissolved until the resurrection. Yes. Okay. Now, I hope you guys got it. I hope you go back and rewind this and hope you guys got it because this is so technical with these fathers. That's why it makes us look like kindergarten girls. But go ahead. So he says then, Though the hypostasis of God the Word existed before, or rather was before all ages and times, Eternal. being eternally with God, God, both the Father and the Holy Spirit, yet still the flesh possessing an, an intelligent soul, which he united to him, did not exist before the union with him. So he's saying that the human hypostasis, which he assumed, because it has to be a hypostasis, and I, I will explain why like, later on, it was not separate or it did not exist before its union nor was a distinct person assigned to it. Okay. And that's because it does not exist before its union with it. So there is no oh. like Jesus walking around before and then God unites with him. No. That's adoptionism. They, they, yeah. yeah, exactly. So it started to exist the moment God became man. Okay, let's break this down for all of my friends. My friends, let's break this down. I love what he said here. He says, the word is uncreated, no beginning, almighty with the Father and the Son. That's your trinity. Notice the quote. <clears throat> Though the Hypostasis, or like he says it, hypostasis. I say hypostasis. You say tomato, I say tomato. It doesn't matter. The hypostasis of God, the word. So this instantiation of the divine nature that we call the word, the word. Notice he's eternal, uncreated. Existed before, or rather was before all ages and times. He has no beginning. Being eternally with God, both the Father and the Holy Spirit. Now it's saying this word, right? Yet still the flesh possessing an intel intelligent soul. So I'm assuming that he believes that to be human, you have to have an intelligent, rational soul, right? So this is me, anthropology, right? Could you just review that? Sorry, I didn't hear that okay. part. So when he says the flesh possessing an intelligent soul, so yes. I'm assuming that in their anthropology, mm -hmm. to be human, you have to have a rational soul. Yes. Okay, but what he's not saying is, that this rational soul exists as a separate consciousness from the word, right? Yes. Because the I rational soul, what is it? Uh, it doesn't exist as its own person uh, yes. outside of the union. Okay, so this rational soul is not a person. It is the word who, as a person, unites to himself this human soul. So it's the person of the word who now unites himself, this rational soul, because the rational soul without the word would not be a person. Yes. Okay. I hope you guys figured it out, man. I, I pray for you so guys. This is the relation between <laughs> prosopon and hypostasis. So again, there is a, a wrong or like yeah, wrong definition that the Chalcedonians did which is that nature equals usia, or essence, which is also wrong and problematic when you read St. Cyril. Oh boy. Nature can either mean hypostasis or usia. So uh, here is a quote, again, by St. Severus. He's not authoritative for the Chalcedonians, but he, he is good to explain how at least the Oriental Orthodox views these terms. And again, we can prove them from St. Cyril and other fathers. But he says, Enough has, I think, been said about essence and hypostasis because, like in the previous letters, he explained what these terms are. But the name nature is sometimes taken in the place of essence, sometimes in place of hypostasis. For even the whole of mankind we call comprehensively nature, as it is indeed written. For all natures of beasts and of birds and of reptiles and of things that are in the water are subjected and are made subject to human nature. And again, we speak of one nature in reference to a single man, Paul, for example, or Peter, or maybe James. Where therefore we name all mankind one nature, we use the name nature generically in place of essence. But where we say there is one nature of Paul, 
the name nature is employed in place of individual hypostasis. So what so he's saying words can be synonymous, huh? Yeah, so what he's saying is when I speak of something individual, Christ or, or Paul or Peter or Sam or Daniel, when I say you have one nature, it means you have one hypostasis. When I speak of two or more, for instance, Peter and Paul, I'm speaking about the general designation of something that they have in common. And then the name of nature here is taken in the place of usia or essence. Yeah, so so just to clarify, because I had in my mind, but the way you articulate it, you confuse me more. So let me let me break this down. Yeah, because I had it, but then you spoke and you blew it away. But anyway, let's come back. Let's figure this out. So, so the people can understand this quote. In the quote, we are told, I told you guys it's going to get complicated. That's why we're going to go slow. The way we're going, I'll probably be 70 years old when we're done with the series. But let's uh, pay attention to what the source is saying. If you're not catching it, if you read the first part, it says, by the name nature. Nature is sometimes taken in place of essence. So these me it means that at times we're going to use this term nature to mean essence. And at other times we're going to use the word nature to mean hypostasis. So this is why there's going to be so much confusion in the debates. Because at one time you can use nature to have the same meaning as essence. But then another time you can use the word nature to mean hypostasis. So when do you know that nature has the same meaning as hypostasis and when it's different? Okay, well, he goes on to say here. Let me read. For even the whole mankind we call comprehensive of nature. So we can refer to the nature of all of mankind. That's right. All mankind, we can speak of their nature collectively. So there it's referring to the nature of of man, so there doesn't mean hypostasis. There doesn't mean all mankind is one hypostasis or hypostasis. All right. For all natures of beasts and of birds and of reptiles and of things that are in the water are subjected and are made subject to human nature. That was my confusion earlier when with the Trinity. Remember, I was defining hypostasis as nature. Well, it turns out you can define it that way now. So you've confused me even more. But anyway. For all natures of beasts and of birds and of reptiles and of things that are in the water subject and are made subject to human nature. Okay, see, now notice here, human nature is being used for all humans collectively. So you can refer to human beings collectively <clears throat> under the rubric human nature. All animals, birds, subject to human nature. Human nature means the essence that all humans possess. So there you see. It's used, being used in, in a universal sense. All right. And again, we speak of one nature in reference to a single man. So Paul, for example, Peter, or maybe James. So Paul has human nature. So there now I'm using human nature for a specific person. Now hear the bold. Wherefore, where therefore we name all mankind one nature, we use the name nature generically in place of essence. So are you catching what he's saying? When I want to refer to all humanity collectively as one nature, their nature means essence. The essence we all possess, the nature we share in common. But then he's saying there's another definition of nature because we use the term nature in one of two senses. So what's the other definition? But where we say that there's one nature of Paul, <clears throat> the name nature is employed in place of individual Hypostasy. So you see what he's saying here? When I say the nature of Paul, now I'm using the term nature to mean the same thing as hypostasis, Pneuma. He's an example and instantiation of human nature. So if you don't get this, you're going to get lost. Not only here, but when Eastern Orthodox speak. So they're telling you the word nature can have two meanings, depending on how you use it. Exactly, which is what we will see in St. Cyril. Exactly. So let me help them out, brother, because you are sharp, because you spent all your life just reading theological terminology. You have no life. You have no Internet. You have no nothing. But anyway, so there are two definitions of nature. One definition means the essence that we all share. So all you animals are subject to human nature. That means to all of us. But then there's a second definition. Crystal, right? has human nature the human nature of crystals 
Now I'm using the word nature to mean knuma, that she is a particular example of knuma, hypostasis of human nature. So the term nature can change meaning, which is why you got to read context carefully. Yes. Okay, there we go. Go ahead, brother. Thank you. I thought I was going to get confused more, but I realize now I'm going to be brain damaged when the series is over. <laughs> so we can look at earlier fathers. This is a saying that every church accepts. And we can see him using this terminology with hypostasis and so on. So St. Epiphanius of Salamis says the following. So they are, for if a mind is the spirit and the spirit a mind, as they also believe, but the soul is another hypostasis along with the mind, along with the spirit. Now, this is the important part. No longer are two hypostases being combined into a man, into one hypostasis. So what is he saying? That a man, which is one hypostasis, <laughs> is combined of two hypostases. If we go by the Castellan definition, it will be saying man is combined by two persons. And that's absurd, I think. Yeah. Most would agree with that. Because let me explain what you just showed. Are you understanding that these are early church writers, fathers, before Chalcedon, and they cannot mean by hypostasis person? You understand what he's trying to show you? If you don't get anything and it's confusing, what the quotes are showing you, please listen to this. When they're telling you that <clears throat> human nature, right, a man, a man, not human nature, human man, has two hypostases. A uh, body and a soul. And these are two hypostases, but they are united in the one man. There, obviously, hypostases or hypostases cannot mean person because that means that St. Epiphanius or Epiphanius is saying the body is a person and the soul is a person, so the man is two persons. Obviously, exactly. the word hypostases or hypostases cannot mean person. That's what they're establishing. And they're quoting the pre-schism fathers. These are yeah. recognized saints. So you understand the argument? <clears throat> so then I think the most important Finally, thing... Finally, Saint Cyril. Beautiful. Yeah. So what is miaphysticism? So miaphysticism is the union of two natures into one incarnate or composite nature. And so that's what Saint Cyril says. But first we have to understand... What are these natures? Because again, are they essences? Are they hypostases? Because as we saw, it can mean hypostasis or essence. So which one is it? So when we read St. Cyril, and this is in the defense of the 12 chapters. So as Subdeacon Daniel mentioned, St. Cyril wrote the 12 chapters. And you have historians like Theodoret, which we mentioned also before. He was attacking the 12 chapters. And St. Cyril wrote 12 defenses against Theodoret. And other others like uh, the bishops of the Orients. But now this let's focus on. I just want to clarify to the audience: this is the Chalcedonians. They call Theodoret blessed. Okay. Yes. So everybody knows that. And Saint Cyril, did he condemn Theod Theodoret? Yes. Uh, yes. Saint Cyril. Saint Cyril calls him an idiot. Are you kidding me? No. Okay. So wait. Saint Cyril called this man an idiot, and Saint and then Theodoret is honored by who again? Who calls him the blessed? Chalcedonians. But they also believe in St. Cyril? Yeah, they say they do. Okay. All right, go ahead. It's so, like, you know what it's like, Sam? It's like if you have Ali and Hussein against Omar and Uthman, and then they're like, they pretend like, oh, it's okay. They're all, we, we like all of them. They fought each other in wars. Yeah. Ali and, Ali and everybody. That's now, let me deal with this one dumb, stupid. And by the way, Asurans, here's another clip for you because you like to take uh, clips. Let me deal with this one dumb, stupid bastard. Canadian contrarian. That's why you're called contrarian, because you're contrary to humanity. Even dogs want to disown you. Who the hell told you that the Holy Spirit is identical to your human spirit? I mean, I met some dumb bastards, but I think you make Muhammad look like he's a legitimate child. You one dumb, stupid bastard. Now, Assyrians, clip that. Shamash Isaiah, here's another clip for you. You one dumb bastard. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so... <laughs> we have to understand what the union is. See, uh, the fathers called this the hypostatic union. Maybe some of you have heard about the term before. So we have to understand what is the hypostatic union and how St. Cyril defined it. Because both the Oriental Orthodox and the Eastern Orthodox, we define it differently. And let's see 
who agrees with the definition of St. Cyril, of what the hypostatic union is. So we believe that the hypostatic union is made of two hypostases, two natures or hypostases. Again, there are synonyms here. And let's then read what St. Cyril says. He says, it is precisely because Nestorius constantly denied that God, the word's birth, happened according to flesh and instead introduced a mere unity of dignities. And it is because he said that a man honored by sharing the title of sonship was connected to God that we were forced to big battle against these notions of his and to assert instead that the union was at the level of hypostasis, meaning by simply that the word's nature, listen here, the word's nature, that is his hypostasis. So he's saying the word's nature is his hypostasis because the word is an individual. So the word's nature, that is his hypostasis, which is the word himself, was genuinely united to a human nature. So he's saying that the word's hypostasis. Yes. Was yeah, united. Before we move on, brother, yeah? uh, make sure you give quotes about the Theodoret and where you call them idiot now because they want references like Orthochristus now. Absolutely. Great. Uh, we're going to give you the quotes in a minute. But before you move on, did Nestorius, I just want to understand, because yeah. you quoted from Nestorius, from what I saw from Nestorius, mm -hmm. he says there's one prosopon, only one person. So did Nestorius say, because here he's saying that Nestorius is saying that, here, let me read what Nestorius is being accused of i'm not saying it's false yeah. i should understand the the, understand, uh, the meaning it is precisely because the story is constantly denied that god the word's birth happening according to flesh and it's in truth a mere unity of dignities and it's because that he said that a man honored by the sharing title of sonship was connected to god now let me understand nestorius did nestorius think that there was not a how do I say this? Uh, because he says one person, so it's not two persons, so that the human nature, that physical body that's being fashioned in the womb of Mary, mm -hmm. did he believe that from the conception, God the Word united himself to that flesh, that human body, so he's becoming incarnate? Yes, but not at the level of hypostasis, but at the level of person. As like, If you remember when I read St. Severus, he says that, you have also you have two different uh, unions you have a union of persons where you share the same dignity so the the flesh which he assumed it it shares in the name of the words like he it, he's called god son of god and so on yeah that's why you have one prosopon but they exist as two hypostases two gnome two two yeah, yeah but they're uh, not two, two persons so. He doesn't say that, but because of him having two hypostases, the union is made of two persons. Okay, this so Nazareth and the Word of God. Let me under, let me explain what people are hearing. Though Nestorius is saying, and Theodoret or Theodoret, everyone pronounces his name, are saying it's one prosopon, one person, but because they're affirming that the divine nature, human nature, are two. Distinct, but no man, who post who mm -hmm. and you invariably end up with them being two persons, no matter how much you deny. It. This is Saint yes. Cyril's accusation. Yes, because each hypostasis would have its own person. If you count that, that's, that's the Eastern Orthodox accusation of the Syrian Church and Nestorius as well. Yes. So then, are they right? No, because first of all, they deny that Christ assumed the human hypothesis to begin with, which is very problematic because it would... No, not the Eastern Orthodox. I'm saying, no. are the Eastern Orthodox right in no. saying that Nestorius mm -hmm. and the Eastern Church end up with two persons, even though they deny it because there's two hypostases? In, in in that sense, yes. But since oh, so, he, the, so their accusation is right then? In, in some sense, yes. Because, but, but then you have the issue of them defining prosopon as hypostasis and so it would like it would be more confusing because nestorius does believe in one prosopon one person no we, i agree with you i'm saying if you go with nestorius no they're not two person one person but yet as saint cyril is bringing out yeah and you accept him because nestorius is using the classical definitions exactly the Chalcedonians change them okay but see here's what i'm trying to get at and it's not because i want people to understand i'm learning too yeah though nestorius 
is denying that two qnume, two instantiations, must invariably mean two persons because it's the one person, right? It's the one person that unites those two natures. Cyril is saying, which is basically what the Eastern Orthodox have been telling me, that though you deny it, inevitably, this is your conclusion. You can deny it all you want, but the way you're defining your language, you end up with two persons, whether you like it or not, yes. though you try to safeguard against it. Exactly. That's so, correct. sweet Cyril, that's what he's saying, but you agree with that then? Yeah, yeah. Then how are you guys still in communication with the Eastern Church of the East? I don't get it. Who? We're not in communion with because of the definition communion, communication. Because you brought in Shamashas and you were talking to it. So how does that work? Well, we love them. We want them to come to the truth. Oh, so you're evangelizing each other. Okay. Good. And uh, right. Sam, also, it's because at least we can agree on something. The terms. The, the issue is because the Chalcedonian changed the ter terms or definitions. It's more problematic. At least we have a common ground that these terms mean the same thing. And from there, we can work on, like, for a union or at least to understand each other. Okay. With the Catalonians, that's impossible. Now, because you guys are blessed, honestly, you guys don't know how much you're blessed because you're sharpening me. You're taking me a higher level, and I appreciate that, honestly. So then now, your accusation is this with the Chalcedonians. Now, let me, now I'm trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm trying to figure this out. Since the story is saying it's one prosopan and that the two knume, they can't be two prasopan because of the unity they're united in the one prasopan and exactly. Cyril is saying no buddy you can say that all you want if you're going to be consistent your position is incoherent because metaphysically it makes no sense you can deny reality reality is you end up with two persons I know you yes. don't want to say that but this is the reality but now yes if that's true, then your conclusion leads to that if anyone affirms two natures, right? Yes. And they don't say that the nature is one, then they are faced with the problem that Nestorius faces because then the two natures would have to, if you're going to be logically consistent, mm -hmm. have to result in two persons. Yeah, for one person uh, resulting from two persons. You hit the exactly. nail on the head. We got it, Sam. You got it. So and the problem with more, you guys. Oh, no, no, no. no, sorry. Go ahead. No, I don't mean. I just want to make sure. So the problem with you guys isn't just Nestorius. Anyone who says at the end of the day, in this Christ, there are two natures. If you're going to take it to its conclusion, two natures have to end up affirming two hypostases. Exactly. But if there are two hypostases, there have to be two Prosopan, no matter how much you deny it. Perfectly put. And That's it's not exactly just us saying it. It's the fathers of the Council of Ephesus also saying it, all of them in unison. So what you're telling these Orthodox is, guys, get with the program. If you're going to condemn the Syrian church, then you end up with Nestorianism, no matter how much you try to explain away your beliefs. The same thing you say about the Assyrian church can be said of you, because now let me explain the logic for everyone else. They're telling you, if you have two natures, right, to have a nature, you have to have a knoma, what they call a hypostasis, right? So if you are, if there's someone who has divine nature, then he is a divine hypostasis. But to be a divine hypostasis, you also have to be a prosopan. But then if you have a human nature, then that makes you a human knoma, but then you have to be a human prosopan. So if you have a nature, you have a knuma. But if you have a knuma and these natures, we're talking about divine human nature, you have to be a prosopan. So two natures, divine and human, end up with two knuma, and then you can't be a knuma if not a person. So if there, there are two knuma, hypostases, there are two persons. So you're Nestorians, Eastern Orthodox. That's what you're saying. And you can uh, just to like correct something, you can be a knuma without a, a prosopan That's as long as you exist in the in the knuma of another. So, because the flesh exists in the hypostasis of the word himself and has never existed outside of it, it cannot have its own prosopon. But since, as you said, everything else was completely correct, because you have two natures, which are two hypostases, and you count them as two, then you have to ascribe to them 
each to its own protocol. Each. Exactly. And the Eastern Orthodox say, no, he's only one who apostasies that united himself to human nature to get around that dilemma. Yes. But you're saying, no, if he has a human nature, then he has to be a human knuma. Yes. So this is the debate. You guys understand the debate. So in the Eastern Orthodox Roman Catholic tradition, there is only one who apostasies. There's only one person who apostasies because they're defining apostasies to mean person. And that who apostasies, the word, took on to him a human nature. So it's not two who apostasies. It's one who apostasies, the person of the word that took on a human nature. But you're saying, but wait, if he takes on a human nature, then he has to be a human who apostasies. And if he is, then he has to be a human person. So you end up with two persons and saying, no, he doesn't have to be. He can take on human nature without having to have that human who apostasies. So you guys are debating on the meaning of terms. And you're saying our definition is right because it's ancient. You came and redefined things later on. Mm -hmm. That's one of our accusations okay, against. Continue. I just want to make sure. Go ahead, continue. Yeah. So, so here we we have several examples from Saint Cyril, which we all accept, and from Saint Severus, which they don't accept. But you can see him echoing Saint Cyril. So, what does he say? He hears the third anathema, which Subdeacon Daniel mentioned. I mean, like the twelve anathemas. This is the third one. He says, "If anyone shall, after the hypostatic union, divide the hypostasis in plural." in the one Christ, joining them by that connection alone, which hap uh, which happens according to worthiness or even authority and power, and not rather by a coming together, which is made by natural union, let him be anathema. Hmm. Well, well, so well, he's well. saying, if one, because Christ is one hypostasis made of two, the word and the flesh, these are two hypostases, they com are combined into one hypostasis. They existed always as one hypostasis, one God the word became flesh if one divides them and makes them into two hypostases because they they are two hypostases in the mind but in reality what when we see Christ we see him as the one Christ the word incarnate if one divides him into two then he's anathema that's one the first quote so but now so people don't misunderstand he's not saying what the Eastern Orthodox say because he's that's saying all. it's that's a all. composite union uh, so it's a composite nature. So the one, the if anyone shall say after the hypostatic union, the divine, divine, the, divide the apostasies in the one Christ, joining them by that connection. In other words, there are two apostasies, but united one person. Let them be condemned to hell, basically. Yeah, if one separates them, the one hypostasis. Well, that's what you're saying Council of Chalcedon did and the Tome of Leo did. Pretty much. But okay, yes. now and help me understand before you finish these anathemas. Help me understand because I was told that at the Council of Chalcedon, mm -hmm. Saint Cyril, they they deliberated on the tome of Pope Leo to make sure it was in line with Saint Cyril. So if Saint Cyril is condemning the statements that there are two natures in one person, that means he's condemning an absent. Because I, you know, I'm not yeah, saying he was, yeah. absent, he was, he was, he was. but they're saying that can't make sense because the people at the Council of Chalcedon accepted the Tome of Leo, making sure it was in line with Saint Cyril, which means Saint Cyril could not be condemning the Aphysitism. This is what I was told. So how does that work? Yeah. So well, like, I mean, that might be kind of like how uh, Muhammad might claim to have tested all of the revelation he received from Allah, allegedly, by the Torah and the Injil. But that doesn't make it true. You, you have to look at what the Injil and what the Torah themselves say, basically, is what we're saying. Because over and over again, and you saw that yourself, like I think in the first session, St. Cyril condemns one hypostasis, uh, sorry, one, uh, two natures after the union, and he confesses one hypostasis out of two, which we are showing right now. We're going to get into it more, too. With yeah. Uh, and uh, and the, the thing is also that the main issue with the Chalcedonians is that they don't even confess a union of hypostases, in plural, I mean, which is what St. Cyril is teaching here. And that's because they define hypostasis as person. 
if we go by that definition, then Saint Cyril is saying two persons united into one person, and he falls into Nestorianism too, according to the Eastern Orthodox like understanding of the word. That's why we cannot understand it that way, because then he would be a heretic himself, which he is not. <clears throat> so, uh, do you want me to take? So it's take either. So, so Sam, what he's trying to say is, it's either the Church of the East is right, yeah. and Cyril is a heretic, or Cyril is orthodox and Diophysitism is heresy. There's exactly. no other option. Sam? I cannot see anything right now. I, I, don't, I, don't, I can't hear on. Sam either. Yeah, me too. I, I cannot see anything. I have my PowerPoint on, so... Okay. Well, let's let's keep reading, I guess. Um, okay. Yeah, go ahead. So, right. so St. Cyril says then, uh, since he points... You, okay, where, where are we? Mess? The second I'll... quote. Do you okay. want to read it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um... Whether it was just these forms that came together by themselves quite apart from their hypostases, for it was not mere resemblances and forms. Can, guys, can you, can you believe it? I lost internet connection. I'm on my hotspot. No way. Yeah, you talk okay, about listen, the we attack. Saying, we were saying when you left, when you left them, we were answering your question. We said, it's either Cyril was a heretic and the Church of the East is right, or Cyril is orthodox and diaphysitism is heresy. There's yes. no middle option. Okay. Well, so before you go on, just let you know, guys, talk about demonic warfare. I lost my internet connection. I'm on hotspot. Can you believe that? But thank God you guys are on. So it, just kept, it kept going, right? Yeah, we did. Okay. okay. If, if I disappear, you guys continue talking because I may lose connection again. So what was the options again? I said it's either the Church of the East is right. And Cyril is a heretic, or Cyril is right, and Diophysitism is heresy. There's no so, middle option. So then, how, how is it uh, they make sure that Cyril is Cyril? Is he cutting off for you too, guys? Doesn't. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to call him. Okay. If you want to Sam, Sam, mute yourself from the computer and just talk from my phone, okay? Yeah, that's no, okay. Go, I'll be yeah, no, in a few minutes. Just uh, when people lose the internet, just... Okay. 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 So, uh, guys, if someone asks a question, could you, like, um, tell me? Because I cannot see the chat. So I will okay. go, like, go from here. Okay. Uh, I'm going to uh, read the bold on the second quote, okay? Okay. All right. All right. Since he points out, or I'll, I'll start from the beginning of the sentence because it's incomplete. Um, since he points out that God's form took upon himself the form of a servant, let him go on and explain whether it was just these forms that came together by themselves, quite apart from their hypostases. Just well, to comment on that. By forms huh? here, right. just to comment on that. By forms here, he mean usiai, meaning like essences. So if he he's saying if you just say oh two essences united. Yeah, you can you yeah. can keep on, but he's saying you cannot just you say cannot two say essence, two. two form. I'm back. Okay. My connection's back. Go ahead. Okay, beautiful. So so Sam, we gave we gave the option. We said either Cyril is orthodox and Diophysitism is heretical, or the Church of the East is right and Cyril is a heretic. There's no middle option. So what what would you say to those so they can get the answer? I'm sorry, I don't want to belabor the point. If they say, Well, hold on, Saint Cyril cannot be contradicting the aphysitism because the tome of leo was only accepted because it did not contradict saint cyril's views it's the opposite of saint cyril and we're going to see that soon okay so but then if you can explain that dilemma because that was what i was told that uh, it's it's a misunderstanding of the metaphysics but go ahead continue now we'll, we'll continue okay um all right so where were we well uh, well i reckon well, I reckon that even he should shrink from saying that if it was not mere resemblances and forms, things with no hypostasis that can join together to bring about the saving union. Rather, it was a convergence of the very things themselves of two hypostases. Then we can really have faith that a genuine incarnation took place. 
Exactly. So yeah. to have a genuine incarnation, a true natural incarnation, you have you have to have two hypostases converging into one another to unite, to become composed. And you cannot just say, oh, Christ united the divine nature with the human nature, meaning two essences, because you cannot have two essences without their own hypostasis. It's like saying the Trinity exists, but no hypostasis in the Trinity. It's absurd. The same thing with humans. It's like saying humanity exists without humans. So he's saying you have to have individual hypostasis uniting into one another. And that's when you can have a genuine incarnation. And then again, St. Severus echoes this, where he says, uh, do you want to read the subject again? Yes. Accordingly, we say that from it and the hypostasis of God, the word, the ineffable union was made for the whole of the Godhead and the whole of humanity in general were not joined in a natural union, but special hypostasis. Okay, so can I break down what we just read from Severus yes, and St. Cyril? Guys, understand what they just told you. Cyril will not accept, understand what they're telling you. Now, someone asked, well, metaphysically, why does it have to be that a nature has to have a hypostasis and that hypostasis has to have a prosopon? Now, that's a good question, but let me just tell you St. Cyril's metaphysics. So, guys, this is all about metaphysics. So I want you to listen. Can I listen all of you? Let me know if I'm making it clear. For St. Cyril, you cannot have two distinct natures <clears throat> because each nature would have its own hypostases without implying two persons. Because if now, what is it implication here? Not all natures require personhood. In other words, he mentioned stone. Let me do this again. I'm sorry, guys. Please bear with us because we want to learn. I want them to learn too. Okay, I'm going to do this. Okay. Let me explain what this is being said here. As stupid as I am, if I can get it, you can get it. Now, Nina is a genius, by the way. She already knows this and she teaches. Not, I mean, under the, the bishop. Nina, if all sisters could be on your level, stuck for all. Even men are not on your level. Nina. Anyway, okay. Understand what is being said. Two gnome hypostases, because early on pre schism they defined hypostasis luma to mean an example, an inst instantiation of a nature. So iPhone, let's imagine there's the nature of iPhone. Here's one gnome of iPhone and a second gnome of iPhone. But to be an iPhone doesn't require you to be a person. Keep that in mind. However, there are natures that <clears throat> require that a knuma apostasis be a person. Human nature, divine nature, animal nature. So understand, not all natures require the particular example instantiation to be a person. So nature of iPhone, this is a knuma apostasis, but it doesn't have to be a person. It doesn't have to have prosopan, okay? But human nature requires that if you're a knuma of human nature, process of human nature, you have to be a person. So when it comes to the divine nature, to be a divine hypostasis, you have to be a person, prosopan. So what Cyril is saying is, if you have divine nature, human nature, two natures, that's two Hypostasis to knuma. That means for each knuma, it has to be a person. So if Jesus has a divine nature, then he's a divine hypostasis knuma. But if he has a human nature, then he's a human hypostasis knuma. But he can't be two persons. Can't. He's only one person. Well, then how does he become only one person? If he has two natures which require in each nature, he be a person. Because the natures became united. They're now one. They're not two. They're one after the union. If you insist they're still two, then whether you like it or not, you're going to have to make them two persons. That's yes. the metaphysical understanding of St. Cyril. Do you understand what the debate is now? I told you guys it's going to be philosophical. Now, you guys get it. You guys have been let. Did we draw? Did we lose somebody? Yeah, I don't, 
I, I hope not. I don't see him. The, the uh, Dioscoros isn't here. No, he's not. So for Saint Cyril, let reconnect. Yeah, let, let him reconnect. For Saint Cyril, for Saint Cyril, this is metaphysics, meaning in his understanding of metaphysics, his understanding, divine nature means that if you are a hypostasis of divine nature, then you must be a person. Because divine nature isn't like the nature of a stone. You can be a pneuma, hypostasis of a stone, and not be a person. So now Jesus has a divine nature, human nature. Well, these natures imply that if you are a hypostasis, a pneuma of human nature, you got to be a person, prasopan. So you're a human person. But if you are a pneuma, hypostasis, divine nature, then you got to be a divine person. So then how can Christ have these two natures and have two pneuma, hypostasis, and be one person? Because after the union, after the incarnation, the two natures are no longer two. They make up a composite nature. And that's the only way you can have one person. That's St. Cyril's argument and the argument of the fathers before the schism. Yes. If you're going to keep insisting two natures, then whether you like it or not, you're going to affirm two persons. That's blasphemy. No matter how much you deny, that's what you're doing. So we got exactly. it so far. Thank you, Azizi. So uh, I want to I want to just say real quick because uh, uh, Sam, you you asked about it, Leo and Cyril, um, and this is just a taste. You know when you go to Costco and they give you those samples, uh, you know those taste those taste samples. When you're hungry, you go there, you eat for free. You eat all the taste the taste samples, right? So. Uh, this is we're going to give you guys a taste of Leo versus Cyril, and then for, for the next presentation, we're going to give you guys much more, many more slides. But one example is this I'm going to read the quotes and I'll give you the sources. Okay, I have them right here on my phone. This is from the Tome of Leo. All right, for although in the Lord Jesus Christ, God and man is one person, yet the source of the degradation which is shared by both is one, and the source of the glory which is shared by both is another. All right, that's that's Leo. Now we're going to hear what Cyril says about it. And Sam, I sent you, I sent you these samples. Okay. Yes. Cyril of Alexandria and his defense of the 12 anathemas. By the way, the defense of the 12 anathemas, meaning what? Theodoret made refutations of Cyril's 12 anathemas. And Cyril made 12 refutations of his refutations. And this is, you can find it on three Christological controversies on Amazon. All right. So St. Cyril of Alexandria, defense of the 12 anathemas. But if something is shared, it cannot be shared by one alone, but always to two or more things understood to be individual and separate. So... Now, and I, I gave you guys the quote, Isidore of Seville, who was canonized by the Chalcedonians, and so many other sources I showed where they are praising Theodoret, and I even showed one where they're praising Theodore of Mopsuestia. All right? Okay. Now, St. Theodotus of Ancyra, okay, he's also canonized by everybody. Exposition on the Nicene Creed. Certainly the man Nestorius is devious to have clouded the truth by the theft of these words for just as above when he stole the confession and in one Lord from the creed of the fathers, he has taken license for himself to say Christ is a name common to many natures. All right. The Tome of Leo. Again, it is not part of the same nature to say I and the father are one and to say the father is greater than I. Leo is saying one nature says this, the father is greater than I. And the other nature says I and the father are one as if natures are talking. Okay. So Jesus, as if he has a light switch, he turns it on and off. He talks like this sometimes, and he talks like this another time. So uh, now uh, Chrysostom, for example, he'll say, uh, where is it? Okay. Chrysostom will say, Christ acts now as man and as God, both indicating the nature. Hilary of Pontia, of course, we do not deny that all his extant sayings belongs to his nature. F from the Syrian, F from Suraya. Your nature is single. Single, huh? Yeah. Aprom Suraya again. The nature that could not be touched by his hands were bound and tied. By his feet was pierced and lifted up. This is a, a tartila, a hymn our ancestors used to sing, it, and we still sing it today. And this is found in the hymns on nativity. 
fourth century authentic Dr. Brock testifies. And Kathleen McVeigh, by the way, who was EO, testifies to the authenticity. Um, Mark, the ascetic, St. Mark, also before the schism. Nowhere in scripture does it say his humanity suffered something or God the word did something. Do you understand that? Nowhere in the scriptures, Mark the monk, this is in against Nestorius. Mark the monk, he wrote. Nowhere in the scriptures, this is according to Anathema 4, by the way, affirms this. Nowhere in the scriptures does it say uh, his humanity suffered something or God the word did something. It says everywhere in the scripture, rather, that he claimed the deeds of the flesh as his own, not only on earth in here and now, but also in heaven forever. And so many others. Um, this is the last one I'm going to read to you guys. And then before we actually do the presentation on this next time. Um, the Tome of Leo. Again, the Tome of Leo. For the impiety of saying that God, the, that the Son of God was from two natures before the incarnation is only equaled with the iniquity of asserting that there was but one nature in him after the word incarnate. St. Cyril of Alexandria, he says, the opposite of this, letter 40 to Acacius. We speak of two natures being united, but after the union, the duality has been abolished, and we believe the Son's nature to be one. Who said that? St. Cyril of Alexandria. After the incarnation, the duality has been abolished. The duality yes. has been abolished, and we believe the Son's nature to be one. One. And I that and even the Tome like of Leo. Whoever says that, what Cyril just said, is only, uh, he's saying, for the impiety of saying what Cyril just said. What now, I before just... I move on, Ortho, he said in the next part, they're going to be putting these quotes on the slide for you to yes. see. But he's mm -hmm. saying he's giving you a foretaste for part four, is it? Or no, they're going to be yeah. putting on the screen. I, yeah. I have, I, I think and, I have and this. He's saying, and he's saying, like, by the iniquity of asserting that there was but one nature in him after. This is Leo <laughs> saying it's impious to say what Cyril said. Can Leo you see saying my this is wrong. Yes, we can. With the same serial code right now. Yeah, this is, it says Klika for At Laga Tel Rubrik. Oh, no, wait. That's What's not wrong with you, buddy? Now, understand as he's bringing up, he's showing you that what St. Cyril condemned, Leo says you must affirm. And what Leo condemns, yeah, exactly. St. Cyril affirmed. Yeah, it's okay. Leo, Cyril saying one thing and Leo saying the opposite of it and yeah. saying now, what Cyril said is wrong. But there, here's the quote. Now, let me explain something for all of you. When you ask, is this wrong? Let me explain to you what the issue is now. Now I'm going to tell you what the issue is. Listen carefully. When you say it's wrong, it depends on two things. What is your metaphysics? Because the debate among them is that they are disagreeing on the metaphysics. You understand? The debate on the two camps is one camp is saying, if you have two natures, divine and human, each of them has to have a hypostasis. But each hypostasis has to have a prosopon, a person. So you have two persons. Therefore, the only way you can say Christ is one person is, after incarnation, they're no longer two, they're one. A composite nature, so he's only one prosopon. But if you have a different metaphysic and say, well, I don't agree with that. I don't agree that a divine nature that has a divine knuma must necessarily have a knuma, I'm sorry, a prosopan, so that there has to be two, because the unity of the divine human nature consists of that one divine prosopan uniting to himself that human nature. So they're debating on metaphysics. So the second question, the second question is prior to the schism, this is the most important one for me. Metaphysics, they're going to argue till Jesus returns. The most important issue is not so much the metaphysics. It's what did the pre-schism church taught. Prior to the council of Chalcedon, prior to the 5th century, did the Christians teach that there's one composite nature? After the union. And if this is what they taught in concessions majority, and this was the view of the church, then that's where it's going to be a problem. Metaphysics, not everyone's going to share the same metaphysics. See, Nestorius did not share St. Cyril's metaphysics. He was saying, no, it's one person. St. Cyril says, no, whether you like it or not, you're going to end up with two persons because this is the implication conclusion. 
And they start saying, no, I don't agree with you. I don't share that assumption. So who's going to decide whose metaphysics is right? So the most important question for all serious students of the Bible and church history, the most important. What did the pre-schism fathers, theologians, writers teach? That's why they're quoting to you pre-schism fathers. The Cappadocian fathers, St. Basil, his brother, Gregory, St. Cyril. And they're showing you, even Cyril of Jerusalem, which you haven't quoted yet, which I'm surprised. We will be citing a lot of them. Even uh, Brother uh, Dioscoros, in his second part, he will be yes. quoting a lot from the Cappadocians. So that's what I need you to do. So if they now show you, and the quotes are accurate in context, pre-schism, before the schism, before 5th century, all of the saints acknowledged by the Eastern Orthodox, the Roman Catholic, Oriental Orthodox, because the Cappadocian fathers, they're saints to all these traditions. If they all taught one nature after the union and one person, that's where it becomes a problem. Understand the problem? It's not what happens in the 5th century because now they're all debating and disagreeing metaphysically. Prior to the schism, when they're one and speak with one voice, if they taught one composite nature after the union, we got a problem. Houston, we have a problem. Now, brother, before I wrap up, I want you to finish your presentation this part. So in part four, you can go into something else. How many more slides do you have for this presentation? Uh, let me see. I have 50, uh, 18 more. Yeah. It's okay. a lot. Well, so uh, how, how long do you think it'll take us? It's almost two hours. Can we do, if you have 18 more, can you do at least nine of them? Uh, you mean uh, right you now? Because Dioscoros has one. So maybe the, right now we could start with Dioscoros's and then continue with. Me. Okay. Yes. Okay. Whatever we can fit. We can go a little over two hours, but I don't want to make it four or five hours because no one's going to watch. Already two hours yeah. is going to be a lot. So, okay. Let's so, go Dioscoros. Uh, can I just finish this point concerning the, yes. the two natures on one nature? So the question then becomes are the two natures completely gone? And if yes, how? So. We don't enumerate them, meaning we don't count them as two anymore. That's what St. Cyril says. But there is a difference in Christ. So here, let's let's read the uh, like highlighted part. Do you want to read it, Sadiqan? Okay. Uh, the, uh, by this very fact, from here, yeah. by this very fact, by this very fact alone, the difference between the natures or hypostases will be appreciated. For God, the Godhead and manhood are not the same thing in quality of nature. Accordingly, when the mode of the incarnation is the object of curiosity, the human mind is bound to observe two things joined together in union with each other, mysteriously and without merger. Exactly. So what he's saying is that we do confess that in Christ, there's a difference because Godhead and manhood are not the same thing at all. So the word, for instance, is eternal, incorruptible, immortal, and so on. The flesh is mortal, circum, uh, circumscribed, uh, uh, corruptible, and so on. So there is a difference in quality, but they don't exist separately from each other. And we can only count them as two natures or two hypostases in our minds. Because when we look at them and try to, let's say, study Christ, the study of Christ, then you have to say two natures. But in reality, how he exists in reality in front of us, he is one incarnate nature out of two. Let me, let me, this is real quick. Ed, they're not saying he did not embrace a human nature. Ed, please try to rewatch it to get it. He did assume human nature, but after the incarnation, the divine and human formed a unity that's inseparable, so you have to speak of one nature, not two. Let me give them a biblical example. Okay. Oh, Lord, this is going to be till you return. So we're not going to figure it out. Anyway, okay. Now, Ed, they are not saying Christ did not take on a human nature. He took on a true human nature. He became truly human. They're saying after the incarnation, the divine human nature are now so united and inseparable that you should not speak of two anymore but one. And the analogy, I'll give you a biblical analogy. Here it is. I gave it last time. Here's the analogy at Matthew 19, verses 4 to 6. Matthew 19, verses 4 to 6. He answered, have you not read, Jesus speaking, 
that he who made them from the beginning made them male and female so notice two different genders two different physical bodies two different physical beings and said for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one now watch what the lord says after their union so they are no longer two but one but wait lord they are two not after the union don't speak of two anymore but the male is not the female the female is not the male yes and the male has his own physical body and the female has their own physical body yes but after the union they are one no longer two i mean the lord says it right here so they're not saying jesus did not take on a human nature that he doesn't have a human nature they're saying after the incarnation they are so united and inseparable you don't speak of two anymore what therefore god is joined together let no man put asunder matthew 19 verses 46 so the issue comes down to is this what the pre schism christians church fathers <clears throat> writers theologians taught if so there's a problem there is a problem that's what they taught one nature after the union one person that's the problem because this is history and you cannot rewrite history but go ahead um just like the last part i can read it like quickly and because just to show that saint cyril believed that the natures are hypostasis like and that both of them even though they exist as one hypostasis they're not mixed into each other meaning like the word becomes flesh like literally like changed into flesh nor does the flesh change into word and he says that and that the nature or hypostasis have remained unconfused shall we say see hence again it's a very beautiful quote because it's talking about the wood and the gold how they were spread and not mixing with, with each other uh, referencing uh, in the old testament but he's saying that the same thing can be applied to the hypostasis which are united uh, but i don't think we have time to read the whole thing so i think brother dioscorus can take over from here okay right well, yep sure how long um, will it take you but how much time you need just, uh no we'll get, more time we'll however much uh, today and then we'll continue it Whatever. Yeah, sure. Well, what do you say though? I didn't hear Dear Phil. How, what is it, Dear Phil? Yeah, like it, it might be best to get through the book of it tomorrow. Say it again. Uh, the next time that we do this, we'll have a lot more time to get through a lot more. Yes. Now, the, the reason next time why, that we do this, we'll have a lot more time to get through a lot yes. more, probably. The reason why this was slower is because I had to define terms. So, guys, in part four, if you're not watching this, there's no defining terms anymore. We're going to move on unless new things come up. I'm going slow and forcing him to go slow because I have to explain terms. So I can get it. You can get it. We both get it. Or this is going to go over your head. You're going to be bored. So go ahead. That's your Just slide. You, you're muted, Dias Carlos. Uh, yeah. So this. Okay. Um, let me try to switch slides. Okay. So that's slide two. <laughs> This one? Um, I don't see the update, but that's okay. This that one right here? Because I, I got to so do it on my. This is, oops. Yeah, this is just the outline of the presentation that we went over in part one. Okay. Um. Now, the third slide is where part one actually starts, and we already went through this, but it it, I think it's helpful to go through it again, especially because Sam, you quoted the scripture that this is paraphrasing. Um, so this is the first homily of St. Theodotus of Ancyra. This is at Ephesus. This is at, this is at in the Council of Ephesus, which has at least three homilies, which are kind of the universally accepted homilies within the codexes of the Council of Ephesus. There are some, like the Ethiopian version of the Council of Ephesus that have a fourth homily by him, but I'm not using it because it's not, you know, within all of the codexes. So, um, yeah, so St. Theodotus here is very clear that the union of two, he it results in a single one such that there are no longer two, but one. And then that not only does it no longer become two, but it says at the end of the quote there in that slide that if you think of two, 
that is after the union, clearly, because he's speaking about how the union of two does this. If you think of two, you are canceling the union. And this is specifically with regard to the natures, because no one disputes, no sides dispute that you can talk about the two which united as natures. This isn't under dispute. The only thing that is under dispute is that whether or not the union makes it so that they are not any longer two of that category, whatever it's called, whatever that category means. And so, um, yeah, and so that's why there's a way to understand which side is right without having to understand the terms, even though no, we are we trying are to get everyone right. to understand the terms. So that's that bears witness. Um, and this also bears witness. This is later in the same homily. He says that the name and by the way, everyone, please, if you're listening, take feel free to take screenshots as many screenshots as possible of these citations because they're for your viewing benefit and for the benefit of those who you want to share it with um so the next citation here from the same homily he speaks about how the nature of the water of the egyptian river of the nile it remained unchanged because it was being used simultaneously as water, but then also turning to blood for the Egyptians. And so he uses various biblical analogies here to speak about how there is a singularity that you can conceive of as being of two. So you can conceive of the nature of blood and of the nature of a body of water, but that these were not two natures. And in this same way, these are not two natures after their union. Well, and maybe they're to address the comment, there should not have been a schism, but that's because people shouldn't have tried to transgress the, the Council of Ephesus. And so that's why we're making sure that we're going over the Council of Ephesus, which all other bodies except the Assyrian Church of the East claims to accept as dogmatic. Claims is the key word. So yes, there were not two things or two natures. This is in direct response. To By the way, before you go on, brother, here's a guy who wants to get his 15 minutes of uh, fame. You I need hope to take a very famous real static. He, he takes to a uh, course in Eastern logic, and he's so great that you run from him. And when the Archangel Michael sees this clown, he also runs from him, but not for the reason he thinks. But go ahead. I, I don't even. I never even seen this guy before. No, but he's he's great in his own mind because he's a narcissist from the pit of hell. Well, but go ahead. Astro, Just, we ch oh, it's Astro, dude. We challenged Astro. We challenged him to a discussion, both of us, me and Diascoro, separately. And I'll host it. Would you do it here on my channel? And he didn't. That's what he said we no. suggested. We told him, let's talk about if Ephesus condemns deophysitism. We're said, going to call no. out your lie on my channel, neutral platform. Bring your bite with your bark, Astro. Because, uh, by the way, if you watch the Jetsons, their dog was named Astro. How convenient your name is Astro. He's not your so let's talk about Ephesus on my channel. Come on. And by the way, we're giving the Robert. opening statement to you guys. So like this, is, this should be an easy challenge because it's I've never are even all... done a formal debate. I just do discussions and I still. Okay, so it. no, he, he can come here and have a discussion on okay. Ephesus. Let's see. Because remember, and it's not a coincidence. If you guys know George Jetson, the cartoon, their dog's name was Astro and this guy's called Astro. So go ahead. <laughs> so yeah, there were not two things or two natures, even though the union was of two natures. And that's clear with the analogy. Um, so, and we'll see how it's clear even further in the self-same homily that it is directly opposed to the Diophysite narrative. You have to explain not why the, uh, the Oriental Orthodox allegedly oppose the proper features of Aristotelian logic that, by the way, the Cappadocians had to refine. Let's not forget that. Uh, but you also need to say, why did the Council of Ephesus fail so miserably if it's dogmatic for all Christians, uh, except for the Assyrian Church of the East? But again, that's another story. Um, now, uh, so further on in the self-same homily, we see that he is accusing the Nestorians by recollecting the natures, saying that they are two things, they are separating what was made one. What was made one? The natures. That's why he says it is the recollection of natures 
whereby they divide Christ, saying that he is two things, and they produce for their own defense that he is one by some rationalization alone. Um, and further on, St. Theodotus is saying, and this is the Council of Ephesus, by the way, that this homily was preached to, which accepted it into its acts, so it's dogmatic. He says, not two, but one, and that is not two being declared as one, yet rationalized as twofold. Yet the Chalcedonians say that the natures which united what was made one, that the natures which were made one, are still rationalized as twofold after the union. And so... Thank you, Unionist Initiative. But I think Sam has been doing a great job, especially. No, no, he means when he fell off on the internet. When I got lost, oh, my internet okay. connection. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, he says, um, that we do not think two, and we admit a single one. In other words, you cannot simultaneously claim to admit one and two, because the two became one according to the same category. That's why he. We can't let either word or concept separate what was united. Well, what was united? Again, it was the natures which was united. The of two. Of two is fundamental to all of this. Yes, it is of two, but it is no longer two, no longer named two. Yeah. If you think of two, you cancel the union. Um, now, he says continually, yeah, or continuing this. He says that if you say one, but rationalize two, you have your concept battling with your word. In other words, what you claim that they were united, the union hasn't really happened because you're, you're rationalizing two while claiming that they're one. So after professing that there was a union saying that they still remain two. So do not say two separated by some difference. And he also says in the next sentence, saying that if you suffer with these concepts, then you deny union. That He says that if you lead your reasoning away to separated natures, you having denied the union, that this is an extreme union. This, is, this term extreme union is what the word became means when we say that the word became flesh. So uh, St. Proclus of Constantinople talks about this, who is one of the two people pre-schism who used these homilies of St. Theodotus. And he uses that phrase, extreme union, saying that the word became, the word became flesh, that it hints to that extreme union. So next page, this is as far as we've gotten now, officially, that this is the, the next homily of St. Theodotus of Enchira, homily two. So now we're done with the first homily. So he says, and this is directly, directly opposed to everything the Tome of Leo and just diophysitism in, in general stands for. So he says that the Jews did not crucify a mere man and that neither did they nail the visible nature only. What did they nail then? They nailed the united nature. United because nature, wow. The united nature is the product or the result of the union of the two natures. This is Ephesus. These are all being presented at the Council of Ephesus, right? Yeah. Right. Homily 2 from this Council of Ephesus 431 by wow. St. Theodotus of Ancyra. Hey, why did they teach me this? Go ahead. All right, go ahead. And notice, notice the analogy. You have papyrus, a piece of paper, really. And you have the word of some emperor, which is very authoritative, his word, his speech, what he commands. Well, if he, his word vanishes into thin air, it's not physical at all. And so after he has said it, you know, you don't know what's being said if you, cut, if you arrive at his destination after he said it. And so he writes it down on a piece of papyrus or a scribe, whatever. Well, if someone tears that piece of paper with his word, imprinted on it, written down on it? Has he torn merely the visible nature that is the piece of papyrus? Or has he torn the united nature of the word of the emperor united to the papyrus such that he'll now be put to death by the emperor for having torn his word? If he tears a blank piece of paper, then it's whatever. You're tearing up paper. Um, so that's, yeah, that's very important that he continues it with this analogy because we see that um, there's one of 
the category like carrying the papyrus you're carrying also the imperial word because they're inseparable right exactly and to be inseparable there means that they are not two such that you can say no it was only the physical one that was damaged the a physical one was not damaged well no because they united so they are now one composite See, you guys understand the analogies that they're given this is at the council of ephesus when the emperor writes his imperial words on a document when you rip the papyrus you're also ripping the words because now they're inseparable. Catch the analogies that they're given at Ephesus, guys. This is telling you composite nature. So keep that in mind. Precisely. Um, I don't know if you wanted me to end there, if you wanted me to keep going a little bit or what. what we how many, uh, in this particular instance, how many more slides do you have? A lot. Okay. Well, here's the thing. What we'll do is, because I want to keep it two hours, so if we go longer, people are going to zone out. Because these are even with me two hours, but I don't go with the depth you go. And, uh, you know, so what we're going to do, Lord willing, if you guys are open, we can do Friday. Friday, Friday, well. Friday same time, Lord willing, yeah. because I want to give people a break to watch this until it sinks in. So, brethren, here's what we're going to do. I want to end it here. Lord willing, if the Lord wills and the Lord gives me health and I'm alive, I don't know. Maybe we, maybe we die today. And if uh, Subdeacon Dunn keeps sending me links, he's going to give me a heart attack maybe by tonight. <laughs> this guy keeps sending me links by Chris LaSala, who hates me with a passion, who I destroyed on debate on my channel. That was that, that PayPal thing. The guy, is the, he's, he's a heretic who I destroyed on my channel, and he hates me with a passion. And he goes after me. Keep sending me, you know, raise up my blood pressure. Anyway, Lord willing. Friday, Lord willing, it's going to be 3 p.m. New York time, Eastern Standard Time, Michigan time for part four. But you guys got to watch this one more time at least because if I keep having to break down the definitions, they're not going to finish until they see their great-grandchildren. So watch this. And Lord willing, later I'm going to do a session on Matamidas. So we're going to revisit some of these terms. So by Friday, they can go into the citations. Now, the thing that's most important for me, I want to know what the church taught unanimously or in consensus up until before the schism. I've always wanted that. So what they're doing is they're showing you what they taught up until the Council of Ephesus. They're showing you Cappadocian fathers, and they're saying they all taught do not say two anymore. Speak of one nature, composite nature that are inseparable. Stop speaking of two. If the evidence is this overwhelming and clear, Houston, we have a problem. So pray for me. Brethren, if you have any last words, go ahead, and we'll be back, God willing, Friday. I wanted to say something real quick, and yeah. that's that there have been accusations that we are quote unquote quote miners. Yes. And yes. the problem with that mentality not is not just that we contextualize and that we explain in depth what's going on in each of these lengthy citations, but even our own ecclesiastical traditions, including the Council of Ephesus that we're reading from, utilized what is called florilegia or florilegium. <clears throat> and this is just a fancy word that designates a long list of patristic quotations, one after the other, after the other, after the other, to prove a single concept or a few concepts that are related. And their own post-schism ecumenical councils, so-called, utilize this very thing. And the problem is that they can't respond to any of this. And we've only scratched the surface. Like I said, I have a lot more to go through. Okay, so then it's a Thursday or Friday? Can, it's Thursday. Uh, uh, is that We're going to have probably the third because Ma Maggot. <laughs> Sorry, he can't do Friday. So you can do Thursday? Yeah, I can do that. You sure? And yeah. I can do Thursday too. Okay, Lord willing, how about you, Diaz Coros? Any day that works for you. Okay, so guys, we're going to have to do it Thursday because our brother, I would say Maggot, but his friend called him a Maggot. Uh, Thursday, God willing, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So just to make sure what you're saying, they can say you're quote mining, but you're going to show from the floral legulum that even in the council, they were citing a host of church fathers who all spoke of one composite nature. Not only that, Sam, the thing is, even the fathers like cite fathers. I mean, like you have 
Leontius, you have Leo having Florelgiums, citing just fathers well, without even explaining them. So like, so, and we're not even doing that. We are, yeah, bring those quotes, right? Sorry? In the right, future, they're going to bring those quotes and show them, right? Absolutely, yeah, I mean, we'll bring these quotes. Yeah. And we'll bring, we'll bring them and contextualize them so that we can explain that. Okay. And no Chalcedonian will be able to explain our contextualizations away because we're going to continue going into as much depth as we've been going into. And they cannot answer how th these quotes in context can be conformable to any of their four to six Chalcedonian Christologies that they've dogmatized throughout the centuries. All right. So you're going to hear their side. Don't forget, February God willing, these Orthodox are going to try to present their case and you decide. I report, you decide. But for me, the issue is this. For me, pre-schism, first 300 years of the church leading to the fifth century before the schism, what did they teach either unanimously or in consensus? That's always been my position. You can go back and watch my sessions over a year ago. That's always been. I want to know what the Christians taught for the first 300 years leading up to the fifth century before the schism. And this is what is gold for me because metaphysics, I leave that for the philosophers. Even if something doesn't make sense to me, that doesn't matter. God is beyond my comprehension. If it's true, if it's biblical, if it's historic, it's ancient, that's what matters for me. So, brethren, if those are the final words, we're going to wrap this up. And Lord willing, Thursday we'll be back on. So, anything else on your part? Thanks again, Stan. We appreciate you, man. See you Thursday. I appreciate you too. Now, understand, since you've been here, I've been attacked much worse than I've ever been attacked before. And you did something that... No one has done yet. You got me under the radar of the Assyrian church so that now I have cut off ties. Thank you, Subdeacon Daniel. Appreciate Anytime. it. Man. Anytime. Thank you, brother. Anything from you, Majid, a.k.a. Majid? No, I'm just thankful that you're having us here and allowing us to present our position. Of course. And I'm going to let Catholics do it. You guys know I am, so don't get angry. I bring people on. There's nothing to fear. If you have the truth, it will stand out. Nothing to fear, but go ahead, the escorts. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much, and thank you to Madge for the wonderful presentation. And, um, yeah, you know what they say, when one door closes, another door opens. Brother, I hope for our doors to be open to all of you who are listening, who are not yeah. already in our body. Brother, my hope is the Lord save me and heal me from my filth and imperfections and struggles, okay. and I finished the race, because at the end of the day, I'm going to leave you with this. We will face Jesus. He's real. He's alive. Jesus is alive. This is not make-believe. We're not talking about no. mythology. No. Jesus is real. He's alive. The triune God lives. And we will stand before the Lord of glory. And we're going to have to give an answer. And I'm already ashamed of myself because I'm going to have to answer for why I am so weak, imperfect, carnal, and filthy. May the Lord have mercy on me and all of us in Jesus' name. So... Brethren, I'll see you guys Thursday now. For the rest of you, because I had my cheetah and I feel like a in bloated, inflated cow, I have to go do some cardio. But I will be back on if you want. Let me know, Lord willing. I can do a session, Lord willing, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Michigan time, New York time, 10 p.m. Because I got to go walk. I got to look leaner than Daniel, by the grace of God. So I got to go get my cardio. And so you guys on for 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, let me know. Because we're going to talk about Madamita, so it's going to be around the same theme. So I can finish my. Oh, yeah, us, Sam? Not you guys. You guys. Okay. You guys are going to. What you're going to do? What you're going to do is you're going to now keep sending me links. Yeah. For the next 20 years until I die of a heart attack. <laughs> All right. Okay, brethren. So 10 p.m. It is. Love you guys. Christ is risen, risen indeed. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Kere day soon. Kere day soon. Kere day soon. Father, have mercy. Son of God, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. And blessed Theotokos, we love you. Pray for us. In Jesus' name, amen. He's risen, risen indeed. Take care.